artificial intelligence is crazy. Uh, many companies are already becoming unicorns in the field, generating billions and billions with this. So ChatGPT could run into these kind of problems where he would need to actually run into some legal or problematic issues, gathering more data so the artificial bot is up to date. More than 3,000 employees and 70 businesses enter a program on June 2022 where they would reduce the working time uh, for four days a week. Ryan Reynolds, he's a genius. A genius that has been qualified like uh, he received the gift of Midas. Everything he touches converts in gold. To whom it may concern, welcome everyone to Common Sense, our freedom space where we cover several topics, research, and in this occasion, news that has hit us recently. Some of them, like ChatGPT4, who has been out for a while and is bringing new possibilities never explored before. Also, we will be covering the possibility of implanting a four days a week working time in businesses. Plus, two cases of success, I would say. Matoshi Iso, the inventor of 7-Eleven, the franchise company that are worldwide known. And then Ryan Reynolds, whose ability in marketing and businesses is unprecedented. With all of this in mind and many more things, let's jump right into today's podcast. As I was saying, today is all about exploring, reading and going through or over this news that I've read. We cover polarization, a radical and extreme topic last week. So for this time, I thought about going for something more relaxed, more calm, where we could actually explore several topics and ideas. I think we are still in a business field. We can learn a lot about them and I can actually practice and give my best into communicating these four things that I've been ready. It's not like I'm in, uh, Having a uh, drawback in creativity? Well, nothing like that. Whatever. The point is, we have a lot of things ahead of us. So, without further ado, let's jump right into them. First thing, I told you about ChatGPT4. Everyone know, everyone knows what ChatGPT is. Artificial, artificial intelligence is crazy. Uh, many companies are already becoming unicorns in the field, generating billions and billions with this monthly revenue system that they have created in and mainly anything. Uh, since the uh, technology went public and patents were available to many companies, this, is ha this has been spreading like crazy. So what we need to do is to learn them, understand them and apply them in our daily life so we can actually use or benefit from them the most we can. Now, ChatGPT4, what is new about it? ChatGPT has been evolving through time. It started with a database back in 2013, then moved to 2017. This brand new version is updated until 2021, which is a huge success for the company and for us consumers. They claim that it's more creative and it's less likely to create or invent facts. Okay, it's less biased by what you've been conversating with him and it's more capable and aligned than his predecessor. So overall, a huge improvement that OpenAI, the company, claims to be. There is one more thing that they're talking about and this is something that was quite interesting which is the multimodality of ChatGPT. If you don't know, ChatGPT is a pure text-based response software, but now they included the possibility of communicating to him through images. So now he can process and handle those images as inputs. He will not reply back with images. That's not something that the software is, well, the artificial intelligence is able to do as of today, but you can actually input images and use them to ask questions, okay? So that's really important because in, in pictures, there is a lot of information that now he's able to uh, process. Great news. Now, what else is with this brand new ChatGPT? 
ChatGPT has increased the capability or the capacity, better said, of text input. And now he can remember up to 20,000 words at once. This led us prompts to be more extensive, to even be able to write a small samples of uh, reports, even a novella, or text chapters. And they claim that it will be this will keep increasing and increasing over time. So what we see is that overall capabilities and the characteristic features, whatever you say, of ChatGPT are increasing over time, which is great, nevertheless. Now, um, these new subscriptions, I think, is also paired because it's a subscription. We'll talk about that later with other apps like Duolingo or I think this this kind of English translating slash thingies uh, that are already on the internet because uh, what they implemented is a transversability between English speakers, French or Spanish, uh, so that you can actually use it as a translator somehow. So they can, the ChatGPT will be able to uh, indicate where did you made a mistake, where uh, the language could have been better and learn along the way with you. So these new additions is really beneficial for those of you who try to be shopping in our languages like myself do. Um, whatever, well, um, there is a few problems with uh, ChatGPT because uh, if you actually don't uh, know a bit about it, they are building one on top of each other. So ChatGPT4 is not a brand new AI, it's ChatGPT3 with an addition. This makes it, uh, learning and correcting some behaviors, even for an artificial intelligence, could be tricky. Uh, it's the old uh, wisdom that says that you can teach an old dog new tricks. And this is partly true, because those old tricks are, are still inside our artificial intelligence, and uh, it's uh, evolving. They claim that it can be done, but this will take time, and here still can be have some uh, things out elapsing or uh, not really closing the circle quite well. But it's nothing to be worried about based upon what OpenAI, the company, is saying. What else to say? Well, um, there are, I'm already fascinated. There are many utilities for this uh, open so uh, artificial intelligence. Uh, you can actually ask them to, through a picture, give you a recipe if it was dated before 2021. The instructions are more precise than ever, and the image precision is wonderful. It's like a big step for OpenAI. But it, uh, better said, is its limit. And not the limit in terms of technology, but in terms of uh, bridging it. The software has uh, been updated to 2021, that uh, it's not, uh, they haven't done it because of, uh, as of 2023 because of loading capabilities or storage. The thing is, uh, since internet and the sectors become more mature, uh, companies and uh, online pages start closing out their borders in terms of information. This is what they call APIs or where they store the information. So for example, Twitter or Twitch, the streaming platform or YouTube, has some information that is hidden to the uh, average user. So you cannot access everything that is uh, concurring or happening inside the platform without permissions, which is a problem because mm, as in the past two years, the uh, exponential growth of internet in terms of data, in terms of these apps, has increased, and also about like third-party cookies. So, uh, for the future, it will be more problematic to gather third-party data, which is that that is collected through cookies, rather than first-party data, that which is the one that you need to go and knock the door and ask for it. So, ChatGPT could run into this kind of problems where he would need to actually run into some legal or problematic issues gathering more data so the artificial bot is up to date. I think it's going to take time and for the few, uh, for the coming months, we will see that the artificial intelligence will grow in terms of features, but not so much in terms of information access. They may update it to 2023, but that would be just with public data that they can find on the internet 
freely. And that is something that we will need to be at pay attention for, because the interesting part about an open AI is to have the whole uh, range or the whole ecosystem or the map of information so he can process and make those uh, incredible uh, transformation. If he cannot access part of the data because they are locked behind a door, we could be running into the missing pieces of a puzzle, puzzle which bring us to failure, to incorrect answers, or to uncomprehensive solutions. And that could be a problem. A problem that is not per se a problem. It's something that we will need to be aware so we just don't fully trust the uh, open AI or artificial intelligence blindly, okay? But so far, I'm amazed that we can have access to so many words, so many advanced information, the integration with the uh, translating companies, and overall that despite not being fully uh, trustworth and that it can actually go crazy sometimes, it is more than we ever had before. So, I'm amazed. And, uh, last one note, if you are from a school of a university, if you're listening to this and you're a student in a school of university, be careful, because ChatGPT has a hidden feature where he can actually determine if the text has been produced by his artificial intelligence or written by a human. So, professors and universities are developing APIs to track and check if you're copying from artificial intelligence like ChatGPT4. So see if that's your case, remember to change some words and don't make it as obvious. Use the help that they're bringing us. That don't be foolish enough to think no one will call you ever. Wonderful news. Moving forward, we have something very interesting, at least for me, which is, uh, which I'm like someone really in the business and working uh, world as of today. And this is the four times a week working time, which has been done is a research based on United Kingdoms, where more than 3,000 employees and 70 businesses enter a program on June 2022, where they would reduce the working time uh, for four days a week. And let me tell you, it has been a huge success for them, and more is coming. If we deep dive, if we dive deeper, where I said, on this research, we can actually look at some interesting factors. The week was reduced to four days a week, but their salary was untouched during the whole trial process. In terms of results, this will surprise you just like it has surprised me. Out of the 71 total companies that enter this program, after the trial, during the six months after the trial, 61 has either continued with four days a week working times or fully integrated in their schedule. Okay? The total numbers are that 18 of them were the companies that decided to keep on four days a week working forever. And that is a huge percentage out of the total uh, sample that they use. Yes, it's a small sample, and we can actually not fully trust if this, is, uh, be, this could be replicated worldwide, but it's a great indicator to have in mind, okay? In the results, the employees felt a significant reduction on both stress levels and disease drops, okay? So they were less stressed and they had to go less into the medic because of diseases or any illness they could have during the years, okay? Some affirmations and some more data about it. Seven out of 10 employees declared to be less fatigue, and 4 out of 10 declared to be less stress. So we have a 40% of less stress and a 70% less tiredness of going just 4 days a week in their time. Now, 
This is really beneficial for employees, but what about companies? What if you're a company that are actually considering doing this for yourself? It doesn't matter if you're big, small, uh, starting or uh, settle on fortunes. Well, in terms of productivity and uh, return of investment, which is what matters, we don't have clear numbers about the bid in these companies, but we compare and they've done one year to the previous one, they uh, actually saw that 65%, the, a reduction of a 65%, sorry, on uh, jobs because of disease. So 65% less people had to go and claim a disease drop in their working time. And then a 57% less abandon rate of companies, okay? So people felt that they were more value and they felt happier on their working uh, seats or whatever you call it, which translate at the end to an increase in benefits and an increase on productivity of 1.4%. Yes, it is may not be a lot, but that is extra based on what companies already has planned. So companies who grew, right? the media of 1.4% of variation, positive variation on these companies by implementing a four days a week working time. What we can see is that this uh, experiment was beneficial to both companies and employees. Yes, this is more focused into productivity and the wellness of employees, not companies per se, but we see a positive relation between both of them, employees and companies. This research carried by the Cambridge University uh, in association with the Boston College, where part they participate with a lot of employees and a lot of companies from minorities, like big, small scale, big scale, uh, financial services, animation studies, even fishing shops, okay, like butchers, uh, consultancy, marketing, technology, uh, hotels, marketing, everything, okay, health system, like the health uh, sector, a huge diversity of companies, not only one of them that could be benefited, a lot of them, um, this 32 hour uh, uh, total uh, working time has been or has allowed employees to conciliate work and uh, social life better, have more time for their family. And uh, that is what they actually claim to have for, that working less brings to higher and better metrics of happiness and that doesn't decrement companies at all. So what do you think? Do you think that if you would feel more value for companies, there are companies that are already doing this uh, work from home if hybrid system, there are companies that are still uh, forced to go five times a week to their offices. What do you think it would happen if we would actually start changing more into a four times a week uh, presenciality in work and one day a week at home? Do you think that would influence a lot your uh, position or your, uh, uh, yeah, your, your productivity raised or in the contrary, that would benefit it a lot and allow you to stay more time in the company, produce more and overall be happier uh, for you. Uh, more inclined to the second one myself. So great news. I hope that soon enough we see more companies moving into this duality for this a week system and that more and more countries uh, join this experience and those research trials so we can advance now actually move into a better world, which is the main point out of everything in life, improving and growing better. Great. Second topic. Let me check my notes. We're moving and we're doing amazing. Okay, let me tell you. Finally, to finish up the day, we're not going to take much because this is a more short uh, give and take uh, episode that a long one with a lot of deep and intrinsic topics. There are two business cases that I've read provided by The Hustle. This is a weekly newsletter about news uh, that I follow and I like a lot. And in this uh, time, they talk about 7-Eleven uh, creator 
Matashi Ito. And this is what I brought you today to discuss. Matashi Ito died a few weeks ago at the age of 98, okay? The uh, creator of 7-Eleven and a person that we owe him a lot because uh, without him, things wouldn't be in terms of convenience stores uh, like we know them today. So if we read through the uh, topic, we could actually understand a bit more about him, which is the point, and uh, see how he got to be uh, where he was. Um, if you don't know, uh, 7-Eleven, they merged with a Texas company in 2017, and at the end, what we all know of, of as of today, is that they are a insanely big convenience store that they open daily from 7 a.m. to 11 p.m. Okay, that is what we know about 7-Eleven. We know their characteristic 7 logo, red and orange, with a green line. And if you ever went to Japan, you would actually know they are everywhere and that they are super convenient, just like the name says. But how did he get Matashisto to build such a big uh, empire of convenience stores. Well, the story uh, falls back or goes back all the way to when he was uh, the president or when he got to be the president of his family's clothing store. His family had a clothing store and he actually went and presented the uh, store. But that was not enough for him. Matashi Ido knew that there was a lot more to be explored. He already was in his business of stores and he understood the uh, pain points and the uh, needs of consumers because he was there and he claimed all the way to be the president of his own store. So in the 60s, uh, he launched his first shop, okay? Not based on clothing, but in groceries. It was called Ito Jokado, okay? Uh, and he only did one thing. He was obsessed to improving things and he looked where uh, the economies were better than ever, the United States. And he literally copied, in a way, or inspired him by those US stores that preceded him to open his first one. But he knew making something similar to the United States would not allow him to grow and settle him on the Japanese landscape. So, 10 years later, around 1970s, he made and super smart move. He attempted to secure a Danish license, okay? For me, a Danish license, and uh, it's, I'm, I'm not familiar with the legal terms uh, correctly, but that kind of licenses allow him to bow uh, 7-Eleven. And at that time, Japan didn't have anything like licenses to open franchises that we know today. But he fought for it, he pursued everything, and he created a license of 7-Eleven. This would mean that he didn't need to open the store himself, but could let others grow and uh, open his stores at his name. This is what we currently know as franchises. Um, yeah, this is where he opened his first 7-Eleven in 1974. And this was a boom. Convenience store that were 21-7, that uh, shortly after they would call the uh, name of Convini in the day-to-day uh, <clears throat> -day culture of speaking, just explode and everyone was so in love with them that this kept increasing and increasing and I start getting into every corner of the Japan's like it. Ten years later, in the 80s, he already had an empire, which included more than 4,000 7-Eleven stores across Japan. And just in 1980, he was generating $12 billion in annual sales. This is an information provided by the New York Times. In a matter of 20 years, he went from his presidential at his clothing store to have one of the best empires in convenience store in Japan. He uh, had a clear vision and he actually uh, uh, demonstrated that when in 1991 he purchased 70% uh, of a floundering Scotland uh, company 
And then in 1982, uh, he had some problems because of uh, paid off with uh, companies in Japan, and he was replaced. He was replaced by by another uh, president, but he con he maintained his position in the honorary term. And you know how Japan honorary system works, and he's been there uh, since the nineties uh, until the day he until the day, the day he has died. But he had a clear vision. He may have some problems, he may have some controversy, but he actually understood the needs of consumers. Um, when they, he opened his stores, he copied the US system, but he offered a huge selection of fresh ingredients. They prepared them there. You had a communal system to be there. And overall, he, he copied the structure of a US store, but he made it a company, he made it personal, and he implanted that in the Japan culture. And that is wonderful. And if you're wondering, 7-Eleven Holdings, which is a massive company now, is operating more than 80,000 7-Elevens worldwide. And in Japan, yes, the small Japan country has just 21,000. Massive success for a company, massive respect for uh, Matashi Ito, who know what to explode, who adapted perfectly, and who transform his vision, leader by leader, to be where he is. Lastly, it's time to talk about favorite actor of uh, a lot of people, Ryan Reynolds. But this time, we're not here to talk about his new film, or his uh, completely failure of Green Lantern. That has been done before. We are here to talk about businesses, and he's a genius. A genius that has been qualified like uh, he received the gift of Midas. Everything he touches converts in gold. But is it pure luck? Or he has some strategy and something behind him that proves his geniusness? Let me tell, uh, let me start by talking about Sexiest Man Alive, or that was many people declare. He is exceptionally good at business. And this can be proven by several examples. Uh, the first one is that in 2018, Ryan Reynolds acquired 25% of Mint Mobile. This was a prepaid company, prepaid for plan company, that was using T-Mobile wireless network. Well, this week, he, well, last week, he announced that he bought the entire company for 1.35 billion, okay? Three years later, four years later. And the CEO of T-Mobile uh, talked about the formula of not only Mint Mobile, but Ryan Reynolds figure around it. And the thing is, he mentioned that he became the middle piece of a chessboard where thanks to the figure of Reynolds and their appearance in a video announcing the acquisition, the company experienced great benefits overall on the process, and that was reflected on their stock market. And the thing is, Brian Reynolds does not only uh, buy his company, he really involves himself in them, and that's the key for many of these transactions. Reynolds co-founded a production studio, Maximum Effort, in association with 20th Century Fox. And this allowed them to build a production studio back in Canada to launch his own network uh, of football and overall grow his own stake. This allows Ryan Reynolds companies, okay, every company that he buys to produce not only films, but funny, engaging, and topical ads to grow on the internet. Let's put a case of examples. Davos Brands Aviation Gene, okay, he took a part of the stake in 2018, and he did the following, they did the following, the, the production company, 
They follow up Peloton's uncomfortable holiday ad about a woman who received a bike from her husband. Aviation pa this was an aviation parry featuring the same street, the same actress Downing and Martini went viral. Uh, well, the, 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 the text here is not clear for me at least, but the point is that they uh, make this parody, these funny jokes. If you've seen any of the videos of Ryan Reynolds uh, showing like Deadpool, like the trailer that he launches on his own Twitter profile, you would actually have an idea of what he does. He literally uh, that did something really smart. He has one superpower. What was what is Mike uh, Ryan Reynolds' superpower? Acting, funny, really funny, and the humor, the out of topic that you know his way beyond. This is why Deadpool is so good because it fits perfectly Ryan Reynolds' personality. Now you have this superpower of personality that everything you have is involved, or you have this. Uh, this, well, this, this, this structure, what, how can we call it, this additional value, which is funny, like parodies, you, 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 you learn how to perfectionate those kind of things. And now you are into the business world, you are buying companies, you want them to grow because you have a stake on them, you need to do well, because in the future you may even acquire the full integrity of them. So, if I'm really good at making parodies and funny acting and I'm building companies, how can I actually uh, boost, in a way, those companies? Well, what he invented or what he has done is get himself in the middle of, say, boosting platform. Do you know many investing capital firms boost and uh, launch you? This is what they call the, the launching uh, programs and all of that for entrepreneurs. But entrepreneurial companies. He literally does the same. He bought companies and then he runs them through his uh, production firm to boost their virality, their presence in social media, and overall get them to be known so more and more people could have access to the service of the company he just bought. And he did that. He took a stake of Aviation Gene, which is, uh, let me look at them. I'm going to actually look at them uh, right now, but Aviation uh, Gene uh, yeah, it's a alcoholic company based on uh, it's an American gin. Okay, that's why I don't know it. But he bought it. He boosted it through virality, one of all his production. And then in 2020, he acquired the firm for 60 10 million there. Okay, and now he has a company on the food and wine industry. Uh, and I think in 2022, yeah. He opened a distillery in Portland, Oregon, that ends with an escape room set in Reynolds' office. Once again, he opens a distillery and he implemented the parody and the uh, humor of Ryan Reynolds having his own office in, the, in it through an escape room. I mean, that is their genius touch on to businesses. But there is many more. Um, he, and this is for, of an interview, I just even saw the, the clips. He slipped into someone's DMs and he ended up buying uh, a fifth division uh, football team. Okay? And he literally wanted to revive it. But we are talking about a fifth division team. It's nothing crazy. And he invested around 2.5 million. For a 25 year, local stadium lease. What he did is, once again, go to his production company and make a documentary series about the process. You have the least profitable company and the least expected one to grow. So what you do is use that as an excuse to grow your production company, creating series, making people to practice, and being better at doing this kind of docu-series, documentary series. And he scored success. And ever since, uh, he actually uh, signed a sponsorship with Myriad that uh, triple the ticket sales of the fifth division football team and increased a, and made a boom on social media. He's using a production company, his humor, not even, he doesn't even need to be on screen most of the time because that would damage his own personal brand, but he's using his style of humor that everyone literally immediately links to Ryan Reynolds to boost anything he buys. 
This is why they claim that he has been gifted with a Midas touch. And I think uh, he's now doing the same with a Canadian, a Canadian hockey team. Um, the point is that anything he tries to acquire, or take a stake on, or build, he put it through a new lens to uh, produce series, videos, or communicate about it in his personal approach to marketing and branding campaign. Um, and I will actually took half an eye for some of these companies and some of these ads to actually rate them uh, in the future. But for sure, uh, if we can learn something uh, in today's podcast is that both Matashi Ito and Ryan Reynolds did one good thing. They both had a vision, acquiring companies, building, blah, blah, blah. But they understood their strong points, where to look at, and what people needed. But as he is, so made his convenience stores to be closer than ever, so you felt part of a family. And Ryan Reynolds is making that every company he buys makes you a laugh. And is happy for you to have access to his product or be in touch with this company. It doesn't matter if it's gin or if it's football. He always finds a connection between the company and you, the consumer. And this is why sometimes we forget about the mere pure existences of marketing or why we're here is to connect with the audience. Because without them, we are nothing. Just like me. <coughs> so, with this, we conclude today's podcast. It'd be really entertaining for me to go over the several topics, find the linking points, uh, talking about ChatGPT, which is uh, pure uh, recent news, but about businesses like Brian Reynolds and Matashito. I really enjoy the process of learning. I myself learned through speaking to you, but I hope you could actually get something in return out of today's conversation. Remember that this is your free space to and safe space to communicate, tell anything, and always through the prisma of common sense, of uh, charisma and uh, rationality, where we try to uh, comprehend their society to move and to progress as a whole and uh, not as individuals. I hope that you could found something out of interest in today's and as I always said, to whom it may concern. I'll see you on the next one.